Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Sydney Coach Replay Show. I'm super excited for today's episode because I know that our coach and I both really think along the same lines for today's topic. Uh, today, we have with us Kathy Pratt. She's one of our Sydney virtual coaches on our virtual coaching team here. But in addition to coaching for Sydney, Kathy has a lot on her plate. She's an educational consultant focused on helping instructional coaches coach with confidence. She provides on-site virtual training as well as virtual coaching for instructional coaches. She believes that everyone deserves a coach. She's the co-author of The Coach Approach to School Leadership with Jessica Johnson and Shira Leibowitz, and is currently working on her second book with one of my friends, hers as well, Kenny McKee, um, as they are exploring compassionate coaching practices to help release teachers' greatest potentials. In her spare time, she loves to read, mm -hmm. write, travel, craft, and take her dog, Boji. If you follow her on social mm -hmm. media, you know who he is. Uh, as he's a certified therapy dog. She takes him to read to me events at the local library. So welcome, Kathy. Well, welcome. Uh, thank you, Corey. It's so great to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited. I know we, we've been wanting to have you on the show for a while now, and you've been busy, of course. I mean, you're writing your second book right now, and of course, you've been busy with us uh, here at Sydney and on, on your own things. So I'm super excited to have you finally on the Sydney Coach Replay Show. Thanks for I'm joining us. I'm excited to. Thank you. So today I'm excited about this topic because I know it's it's part of one of kind of your your core beliefs um, and it's one of mine as well. We're going to be talking about um, how coaches need coaches too. Not just that we need coaches, but really every coach deserves a coach. So talk to us a little bit about um, your thoughts around this and, and why it's so important for us as coaches to continue our own professional learning and maybe even invest in partaking in a coaching partnership. Right, right. Well, it kind of stems back to a video that I had watched from Atul Gwandi. And if you don't know him, he's written several books. Um, the Checklist Manifesto is one mm -hmm. of them that I use often. And he, he discovered that as a surgeon, he uh, needed a coach as well. And so he would have a coach you know, up above the operating room and watching his every move and then helping to reflect. And when we think about the job as coaches, we know that coaching and receiving coaching can make an impact. Um, as coaches, we get a lot of training. Uh, we do a lot of our own reading. And when we do that, we probably have run into the chart from Bruce Joyce and Bev Showers mm -hmm. that talks about the training components such as theory demonstration and low level feedback that we get when we go to these trainings. And um, so in that chart, as you can see up on the screen, we gain a lot of knowledge and skill when we go and partake in theory and modeling and low level feedback and practice. But the key is that transfer into the classroom. So as a teacher, without coaching, the transfer from any professional learning opportunity that they go to probably is about 5%. They're not going to be uh, implementing things to the fidelity and the robustness um, as the training probably laid out. And I really feel the same is true in coaching. We go to a lot of training, we go to a lot of, uh, we read a lot, we go to Twitter chats, we network with coaches, but until we have that element of coaching for ourselves, um, I don't think we get to that robustness of the training uh, that we receive. Um, so I really strongly believe that coaches um, should be the most coached person in a building, mm -hmm. um, not just training, not just networking, but actually that reflective conversation with a coach. Um, and they need to experience coaching firsthand so that they understand the impact it makes in their own role so that they can impact others. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, and, and I love that you share this chart. This is when we were talking before the show that 
I um, used to share all of the time for a number of, of, of reasons. You know, I was a um, consultant at a regional service center in the special education department. And often I spent a lot of my first year doing more of the compliance and best practices training, especially around specially designed instruction, standards based mm -hmm. IEPs. And, you know, I presented theory and I we did modeling. We had, you know, the use case of Johnny and um, they practiced a little bit in the session, but there's there's this huge discrepancy between the, not and Doug Fisher talks about this as well, an individual's knowledge, especially an educator, no matter your role, right. your knowledge of the theory and, 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 and knowing even what it looks like and actual practice in your role day to day. And that's really where coaching can come in. It can help you. I like to call it the messy middle, help right. you in that that discovery piece is you're transferring that new learning into practice. So yeah, yeah you know, it I, really is paramount. In my work, I, I notice, you know, in Iowa, we have a huge push in coaching and, and things are going well. And I'm extremely proud of our state. Uh, but many of these coaches were classroom teachers moved to coaching and mm -hmm. they had not had a coach in their school prior. So they had never received coaching themselves and they were top notch teachers and they had a lot of success in the classroom mm -hmm. and they had a lot of you know pedagogy behind them, but they themselves had not seen the impact of coaching. So yeah. Yeah. to, to help a person. And I, I pride myself along the way. I think I sought out mentors and coaches before I even knew coaching was a, a thing. A thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember going to my first gym night training 10, 15 years ago and like the light bulb moment went on and said, this is what I've been doing all my life. You know, yeah. I've, I've been mentoring even back in high school, I was mentoring the person to get on the drill team and that type mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, when I heard about instructional coaching, it kind of dawned on me. But then I find that coaches also need to benefit from coaching. Yeah, it doesn't mean that because you've crossed that threshold that you've got everything you need. You're a master, right? That we have to, you've got a new set of skills to learn. Working and, and mentoring, you know, students is completely different than working with adults. And right. you're right. There are many, many coaches, um, even today, who have moved into a role and have yet to be formally right. trained. They maybe picked up a book or two, exactly. but they haven't had the privilege of going to like a gym night or a Diane Sweeney or a Killian training. That, so so right. um, it's definitely a need for sure. Right. You know, so then, schools spend a lot of money in mm -hmm. when they do train um, their teachers. There's there's a huge investment if they're training um, right. travel, food, the cost of a conference or whatever. And if you're only going to get 5% return mm -hmm. on that, I mean, as a business sense, I think you want to have that return on investment a lot higher than sending your coaches to a institute and then expecting them to know how to do that themselves when coaching is so individualized to every teacher's needs. Right, right. And, and even, you know, one of the things that my former district did was when we rolled out something new with our teachers that the coaches were expected to then follow through and support, the coaches kind of went right alongside the teachers in those trainings. Right. The problem was, and the longer that you've been out of the classroom, the more likely it has been it, it, that you're going to be faced with a, a model or pedagogy that you didn't actually do in your own classroom. Right. So right. even though I'm learning right, right alongside the teacher, this, yep. you know, maybe it's reader's workshop. I hadn't done that in my own classroom and mm -hmm. I'm learning it right alongside. Yes, I can support them to a basic level, but I haven't had any practice in it. Right. I don't know what it's like to kind of run that. Who's right. going to coach me through the parts right. that we know those teachers will need coaching with. So, right. yeah. 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 So, so then what does, uh, Kathy, what does coaching for a coach look like? 
Well, you know, if we think about a, a typical coaching cycle, whether you follow Jim Knight, Diane Sweeney, they all pretty much have the same components. And really a coaching cycle for a coach is very similar to a coaching cycle for a teacher. Um, in my own work, I meet with coaches virtually. Um, I try to learn a as much about them as I can. And there's limitations because we're not even in the same state or country. Um, and so I have to really find ways to figure out their strengths and their challenges, yet not let them go down their challenge path too long because we want to get to work and work right. on them um, because we can dwell in our challenges and then never move forward with them. Um, then helping them to develop some possible goals and then narrow that down to something specific. Um, many want to address the challenge of, um, or many want to address their challenges, but for me, it's looking at their strengths and drawing upon them so that it would be as much the same as I would do with the teacher. Uh, we often get some baseline data. For example, many coaches want to work on their reflective conversations with teachers, and they want to look at the types of questions they ask and the return they get for that type of question or the ratio to teacher to coach talking. Um, and so then we utilize video and we actually utilize Sydney, um, or sometimes we just have an audio converse, you know, tape of that if the coach isn't ready to do some videotaping. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, then we start to break that baseline data down to some specific goals. Um, if we need some training, we do little micro pieces of training rather than two, three day worth of training. Um, we just get very specific on the need. They might need some resources. So it's much the same as that cycle we do with teachers, but giving you the coach the luxury to have that done with you um, mm -hmm. and to move your professional practice forward to get that level of transfer that you want to have. Right. Right. And, and I love that you say that it, this really does parallel the same type of a, a cycle um, or the process we would follow with the teacher, because I think that's important. Sometimes that process is what a coach maybe needs some support with, knowing the next best step and how to kind of go from start to to at least end of like if they're doing the impact cycle. Um, but it's it's definitely also just that walking the walk, right? It, and it gives it gives that coach a, an additional um, relatability with right. the teachers they're working with, right? So. Yeah. You mentioned video, um, and I love that that you're using Sydney. We encourage a lot of our teams that we, the teams I work with and do consulting with, who are getting ready to start using the video and Sydney specifically, um, and how they can use it for their own practice. But it's hard, and no matter what level we're at, video is vulnerable work. Nobody enjoys seeing and hearing themselves on video. It's a fact. <laughs> we know that 100%. But it's also the most powerful tool right. we can really have in our arsenal. So how do you help instructional coaches see the power in using video in their own practice, especially if they haven't been using it at all with the teachers they're working with? Yep. Well, it's, it's channel your inner Brene Brown and, and my get girl Brene. vulnerability. Yep. And mm -hmm. I remember going to a training with um, Ann Hoffman. She's one of the senior consultants with Jim Knight. And she calls it the purple pants syndrome, where you just got to get over, like, I shouldn't have worn those pants today. They don't, you know, <laughs> that, you know, it's like, get over that your hair didn't look right. Or because mm -hmm. we're, we're so attached to that, you know, persona would give off in pictures and in video that mm -hmm. you just kind of have to move past that. Mm -hmm. But quite honestly, I mean, I don't drop the hat of we should videotape this to the to the coach. I, you know, when I have them come up and say, I really want to work on that conversation. And I ask them, well, what could we gather for some baseline data to see, you know, how is that conversation going right now and what's our current reality mm -hmm. they'll just kind of sheepishly say well i suppose i should videotape myself so i really <laughs> it, i really try to 
get it so that they come up with the idea themselves, mm -hmm. not that, hey, I have this great tool and here's how it works. Um, so then they see that, hey, you know, it's not so bad, you know, especially mm -hmm. on a platform like Sydney, everything is private and it's not shared with their administrator and the outside world. Like I've forgotten to click private on a YouTube video yeah. and it's out yeah. there. Um, <laughs> So, you know, then they can watch that and, and really get some goal setting completed because mm -hmm. we can remember the conversation, but it's another thing to watch that conversation mm -hmm. um, and see, you know, tally the types of questions you're asking and tally the times that the teacher's talking to the to the coaches talking um tally the return to look at the um the posture of the teacher is yes. she accepting the the conversation is she just sitting like this you know whatever i mean there's so much that video can show us that and I don't know about anybody else's brain, but my brain doesn't remember everything. So. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. There, um, I mean, there's some. I mean, and there, there's research behind that, right? And Jim Knight does a great job of kind of summarizing that, right? We've got our, our, um, hab our habituation, which is our kind of autopilot, and there are some times, and even some circumstances, depending on, like, if, especially when I'm talking about special education and it's a new teacher, I almost like can just do that with my eyes closed, I feel, even though I shouldn't, right? So, but I can easily go into this like autopilot zone and not catch that I've lost, I've lost them and right. I, maybe I'm overwhelming them or they already knew that. And they're giving me these signals like, yeah, 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 yeah I got it, I got it. And I'm not listening to it. Um, right. are, we have false memories all the time. Confirmation bias really falls into that and then, um, it's just, it's complex. You're having a conversation and you're, you're looking at all of those things like the body language and the way, the way that they're responding. How are they answering the question? There are so many things, just like when we're teaching a classroom right. that right. we've got to consider. And one of my favorite things with video is to look back at the body language. Cause that's yeah. usually the thing that I'm really surprised I didn't notice something right, of. Like right. I, I'm a pretty good, like I can, if they, if they like lean back and cross their arms, I can, I catch that pretty quickly, but there's even some more subtle things that I can see back in that video that are pretty powerful, um, both for myself. I'll look at my body language, but I also right. look at the body language of, of the coachee as well. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm very careful not to, you know, Yes, they upload it into Sydney, and it could be easy for me to go in while well, you were doing this, and you should have been doing this. I, you know, I'm not critiquing the video. In fact, with whenever I coach a teacher um, or coach a coach, and I'm using Sydney, I have them make comments first. I want them to tell me what they notice, mm -hmm. uh, what questions something might be bringing up, what are some next steps that they notice. I wrote a blog post on that a while back, but um, using some questions like that before I even get in there and make some I notice um, types of things. And when I'm using feedback, I'm only looking at uh, feedback towards their goal. I'm not, you know, if their goal is the question type, I'm not going to start commenting on the body language of the teacher mm -hmm. because our goal right now is to focus in on the types of questions you're asking and um, the return you're getting. If they're one word answers, if they're very low level reflection, mm -hmm. it wasn't part of the question that could have been rewarded. Or are we asking too many questions you know, yeah. and, and not giving the teacher enough time to reflect? I mean, my go-to questions, even with coaches is the, um, Michael Bungay Stainer's coaching habit, and I'm so mm -hmm. excited. New books about ready to drop in. I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I'm also waiting. So you know, I'll I'll say to them like right when I was learning those questions, I said, well, you know, I'm learning some questions right now. I received some training from him and read his book. And do you mind if I use the questions? And I started using them. And at the next coaching um, meeting I had with the specific coach, um, she said. Well, what were those questions you asked last time? They really helped me reflect. You know, so I knew the power right there that I just asked, what's on your mind? 
and what else and what else and, what else? Yeah. and, and then get down to what's the real challenge here for you and we can get right down to that specific challenge and i'm not doing a lot of scripting out a bunch of questions i'm just there as a sounding board to help them get deeper in their reflection yeah i want to i want to circle back to a couple of of things i really liked about what what you just said in, in that last bit of conversation um <clears throat> first that and i do this as well when when i'm coaching teachers or, or administrators is i go first to their self-reflection. I'm not the first one to leave a comment on a video that's been shared. I also give the option, especially getting started, if I have a good enough, like we can really define what we might look for as we're looking at this baseline, then they may not need to share their first video with me, right, if, right. especially if they're a little, I'm, I can say, and that's the thing I love about Sydney, I can say, look, you've got your own private workspace. When that video uploads, only you can see it. If you wanna share it with me, do, if not, you'll watch and bring your notes and we can, I mean, I can tell when someone's seen themselves on video versus they're, they've just kind of reflected. Right. But I think that is so important when coaching coaches because that's what we want our coaches to be doing with teachers. That's about building capacity. If I'm not helping a coachee build their own reflective capacity. That reflection, you know, Elisa Simmerall and Pete Hall talk about reflection is that transcendent skill. No matter what the new thing, knowledge or skill I'm learning, if I've got this reflection down, I can apply that and I can grow on my own or with a peer. Right. And so I think when we're coaching coaches, that is going to be one of those paramount things that we need to make sure that we're modeling for them so they can transfer that and and having some of those key questions in there as well are, are really important the other thing i want i want because we're talking about video is this is something i've struggled with uh video is a really powerful tool it's like the sword of shira and if you aren't <laughs> shira and you haven't had the right amount of training as the show we're watching right now the netflix yep. series yep. um if you haven't had the proper training you don't quite know how to use that sword right, right. and so right. you're going to rewind and replay and comment away and you're going to spend a common thing especially with higher ed supervisors that <laughs> i'll find is they're like okay i only asked for a 10 minute video but that i spent two hours giving feedback and finding resources and 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 then they didn't say anything back and i was like because you overwhelmed them you like right, shocked right, them into paralysis right. with all your feedback right what was the goal Right. right. So, and if, and if you're doing a baseline, that's a great place to find a goal, but even right. then it should be, how do you feel? Talk to me about the, you know, right. so I yeah. love those two points that, that you, you mentioned that starting with their self-reflection and then um, really staying focused on that particular goal. So, well, and like the Grant Wiggins quote, and I won't have it verbatim but i use it in training but he says you know feedback isn't advice praise and something else starts with an a um because i say ape <laughs> but yeah. but you know it, feedback isn't about the advice mm -hmm. and the praise that's not feedback that's critiquing and that's something different um mm -hmm. feedback is thinking about the goal in mind and it might be that comment i noticed this question mm -hmm. i noticed this you know i noticed your body language here. It's mm -hmm. not saying it was right or wrong. It's just, here's a place, you know, tag yeah. that piece there. So yeah, uh, we, we unfortunately will go to a, a evaluation from a principal and they'll have all this advice and praise and mm -hmm. whatnot. And we tend to think that's feedback then. And really it's not, you know, Doug Fisher and Nancy Fry is always talking about feed forward. Mm -hmm. And so what is that piece then that element that we can give in the moment that's going to feed them forward into more growth mm -hmm. rather than that, oh no, I did something wrong. Because the, the worst thing we can do is make a coach feel like coaching is fixing them because mm -hmm. uh, that's the you know, the message a lot of teachers still have with coaching is it's about yeah, fixing them. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be fixing a coach because I want the coach to be empowered and I want the coach to see what reflection can do for them um, rather than it's about fixing them. Because yeah. Then they go out and they think coaching is about fixing and then that's what they do with teachers. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. 
Well, this has been a really great conversation. I'd like to wrap up with one final question. And that's for those who are wondering themselves where they can find a coach or someone who oversees their coaches and, and is wondering, okay, how do I now find coaches for my coaches? Um, how, how, how do we do this? Where do we go? Especially if we're that coach looking for a coach for ourselves. What do you right, recommend? Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities out there um, and we can find coaching in a variety of ways. Perhaps um, there's more than one coach in your school and you can, maybe you're the elementary coach and you have a middle school coach or a high school mm -hmm. coach and you can coach each other, but you need to be mindful that that's not then getting together and just brainstorming some ideas that never come to fruitation. It's about, you know, finding that, challenge that you have and you want to reflect with somebody else, maybe pulling out Michael Bungay Stainer's coaching habit and going through those set of questions, but really reflecting with another individual. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen some coaches and principals partner with each other because I do believe that principals can wear a coaching hat. Um, mm -hmm. as we wrote a book about it. I like <laughs> and, it. Um, you know, that, you know, the, the principal can, have coaching skills in his or her repertoire and the coach and the principal could coach each other. You might have, um, you know, here in the town I live in, we've got a district of, you know, multiple elementary schools and an overseer of the coaches. So how can we partner those folks up and coach each other? Um, Twitter is a great place to find a coaching partner. I, I have a Twitter chat that I co-moderate with the, wonderful group of coaches that mm -hmm. you know, pop in on a chat and you might find somebody that you uh, have some like-mindedness or you're coaching in the same area and you might be able to partner with each other. Yeah. Um, I've done that actually through the EduCoach yeah. uh, chat. And so it's, it's, it's a great place to find yeah. people. You know, and, and I, as I told Jim Knight just recently, I've been a connected educator and doing this since in the 90s, which people have a hard time believing because they're thinking, was there the ability to do that pre-Twitter, yeah. pre-Facebook and everything? But yeah, I went to a site called teachers.net and and connected with educators around the globe and did projects with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing, if I could be so bold, is that's what I do. I coach coaches. Um, I recently retired so that I can do this full time. Um, it's my way to get back to the profession. Um, I have valued every uh, mentor and coach I have had throughout my career, and I've had many, and I've found that I was my best educator in the classroom or consultant or coach when I had a coach. Yeah. And so if I can spend 45 minutes to an hour with a coach once a month, twice a month, once a week, doesn't matter. You know, it's their time. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's cost effective. It's not, you know, going to a training and leaving your teachers and then coming back to like catching up. It's mm -hmm. find that little hour and then you can go back and do the great things that you do. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. And, and definitely lots of ways. I, I think, uh, absolutely. If you are not in some way on social media connecting with others, then that's the first step that you take. And then there's definitely some more formal ways um, to do that. But finding a peer coach is a great start um, yep. in your building or in your district or just, you know, in, in your virtual professional learning network. So, yep. Yep. well, this has, again, been a great conversation. So thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us today. Audience, tune in next week for another episode of the Sydney Coach Replay Show. Mm -hmm.